All right, so on my clock, it's now 7 p.m. So I want to welcome and thank everyone for joining us tonight for our presentation, Stories Behind the Stones, presented by the Friends of the Ancient Cemetery and the Historical Society of Old Yarmouth. This program is sponsored by a grant from the Mass Humanities Bridge Street Fund. And this is actually our third and final in a series of lectures this year. Uh, that have been brought to you because of the Mass Humanities Bridge Street Fund. So we're, we're so happy to have uh, offered these three virtual programs this year. Unfortunately, we weren't able to do our winter lecture series in person, um, but it's great to see so many familiar and new faces joining us for these virtual lectures. Uh, we do have a few upcoming in-person events. Uh, this Saturday, we're doing a reservation walk. Uh, that's going to be November 20th. You can find out more information on our website, hsoy.org. As well, our annual ecumenical Thanksgiving service will take place the Sunday before Thanksgiving, and that is Sunday, November 21st. And all are welcome to attend this program. And of course, the ever popular Yarmouth Port Holiday Stroll will take place on Sunday, December 5th. So for more information about these upcoming events, please visit us at hsoy.org. Now tonight, we're gonna to be presenting five topics introduced and led by our volunteers from the Friends of the Ancient Cemetery, which is an organization created to preserve, protect, and document the gravestones of the ancient cemetery in Yarmouth Port. You can learn more about this project at their brand new website, the Friends of Ancient Cemetery.org. So that is Friends of Ancient Cemetery.org. You can also pick up one of their wonderful brochures at the Historical Society of Old Yarmouth offices in Yarmouth Court as well. So this program is being recorded. We are going to be uploading this to our website, hsoy.org, and it will also be made available on the Friends of the Ancient Cemetery website. So tonight, uh, we've actually got five speakers for you this evening, uh, and I'm just going to let you know how this is going to proceed. Uh, we're going to have each of our five speakers present their program, followed by a question and answer portion for that speaker before we move on to the next presentation. If you have any questions you'd like to ask any of our speakers, they can be typed into the chat box through Zoom. They can be emailed to us at info at hsoy.org, or you can ask them directly to our speakers after they're done presenting. So during tonight's program, we ask that you keep your microphones muted. If you would like to ask a question out loud, please raise your hand using either the reaction button that uh, Zoom offers or just physically, you know, give me a wave, wave your hand, and uh, I will go ahead and call on you and ask you to unmute. So if you do have that question and you wave your hand, I will uh, send you an option to unmute yourself. You'll see a little pop up on your screen and you can go ahead and ask your question. Okay, so the first of our stories tonight uh, is by longtime volunteer, Ruth Weisberger, who cleaned three very special wilder stones to uncover a hidden prize. So we are going to start by hearing from Ruth. One day, while walking down a path in ancient cemetery, I came across and was struck by a beautiful marker. I had not seen any like it in the cemetery and stopped to study it. The flowers were so intricate, with roses tied together with a beautiful bow. The name on the stone was Zipporah, and to the left was a marker with the name James. A child marker was to the right of Zipporah's with the name Florence Maria. The stones became a part of my walk from that day on, and I often wondered about the story of James, Zipporah, and their child, Florence Maria. 
When it came time for me to clean the stones, I looked at Sephora's stone and thought, I think this may be difficult and caution myself to take care and have patience so as not to break any of the delicately carved petals or roses. As I worked on this stone, I thought how much James must have loved Zephora and wondered if roses were special to her. The stones are marble, which can be fragile. These are how the stones looked before cleaning. The contrast before and after cleaning Zephora's stone was amazing. I kept hoping that there would be a signature of a person who carved this beautiful marker. I kept cleaning and looking, and then there it was. On the lower right corner was a name, J. Milmore, Boston. This was exciting to say the least, as the Milmore brothers were famous and talented carvers. This is the monument for Martin and Joseph Milmore at Forest Hill Cemetery in Boston, Massachusetts. Martin's older brother, Joseph, became a stone cutter and educated Martin in that trade. Martin took it a step further and became a brilliant sculptor. By the late 1860s, the two brothers opened a studio together in Boston's South End and had a number of impressive works to their credit. Among these is the American Sphinx, an unusual Civil War memorial at Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge, Cambridge, Massachusetts. What a find to see Joseph Milmore's signature as a forest stone. It is one of the few signed stones in ancient cemetery. This is what the Wilder stones looked like after cleaning. Florence Maria is the only one of James and Zipporah's children buried in the airport. She died on August 6th, 1838. She was in the second year and seventh month of her age. The records do not reveal the cause of her death. James Sullivan Wilder was a wharfinger in Boston, Massachusetts. A wharfinger was an important job. A person in this position managed, took custody of, and was responsible for goods delivered to the wharf. He would have had an office on the wharf or dock and would have been responsible for day-to-day -day activities, including slipways, keeping tide tables, and resolving disputes. James died in Boston in the 80th year, one month and 12th day of his age. The cause of death was pneumonia, and exhaustion. Zipporah Hedge Eldridge was the daughter of Barnabas in Zipporah. She married James Wilder and they lived in Yarmouthport in Boston, Massachusetts, where James worked as a wharfinger. Zipporah died on February 17, 1866, in the 54th year of her age. She died from what was then called Pisces or white death. We know it today as TB or consumption. These are the wilder stones after cleaning and how they look today. Bright, clean, and beautiful. Okay. Thank you, Ruth, for that wonderful presentation. And uh, now I'm going to go ahead and open up the floor to anyone that has questions for Ruth. Looks like we have a couple in the chat box. So, uh, but if any of our participants have questions, go ahead and wave your hand and I can call on you. All right, so Ruth, I'll ask you a question that came in via uh, the chat box. Were the Millmore brothers originally from Boston? 
Uh, no, they weren't. They were from Ireland, actually. Uh, when their father, who was a schoolmaster, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, died in 1851, the mother and the two boys, who were then age 10 and 13, moved to Boston. Uh, and that's where they stayed, and that's where eventually the two boys took up their carving. Were there any other works that they were known for? Uh, yes, along with the wonderful things which they collaborated on. Um, they did the Sailors and Soldiers Monument, and that's in the Boston Common. And there's the Soldiers Monument, which is in Forest Hills. And that is truly remarkable. Any of these uh, sculptures are wonderful to see. And if anybody would have the time, it would be a wonderful trip to go up and just find these sculptures and see them in person. Okay, so we've got a, another question from the chat. How long are the stones expected to stay in their current beautiful post-cleaning condition? <laughs> well, I hope a long time, uh, but what we're hoping to do is to set up a way to keep track of how our stones are doing. Uh, and eventually there will be um, uh, a, a check on that so that they stay as beautiful as they are. I know many of us, <clears throat> as we're walking, we check on the stones we've done, not just this year, but I know I go back for the five years I've been doing this or so and check on all the stones. And if they need a little touching up, I do that. And I, I think we all do that. Um, so it could be kind of built into the program and hopefully they will stay as beautiful as they are today. Okay, thanks. Uh, another question for you is, are there any other Millmore stones in ancient cemetery? No, I think I got the only one. Okay. <laughs> um, so we've got another question. What do you clean the stones with and how long does it take? Now you're welcome to answer that or I can open that up to one of our other volunteers if you'd prefer. Well, for me, what we do, uh, and I'm sure if Laurel or Melanie would like to jump in or Judy, um, we, it took me, usually it takes our stones to do all summer. We work on them. Um, and you rinse them down, you use a special uh, spatula to take off the lichen, and then you rinse that, uh, and you scrape again, and then you spray with what we call D2, which is a solution that loosens all the lichen off without being harmful. Uh, and you wait a bit and then you scrape again and you keep redoing this process uh, all summer long, really, until the stone or until the stone uh, comes back to its original beauty. Okay, uh, Melanie or Laurel, you want to jump in and add anything to the materials that... Uh, no, that, 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 that's the process that everybody has been using. It's important that people realize that you do need to use this particular uh, biological solution, the D2, to clean a stone. Okay, thank you. All right, so if there are, looks like there's no more, oh, sorry, one more question just popped up. How much does it cost to clean a stone? Well, there's a good question. <laughs> Not you answered. <laughs> I think you would have to ask, uh, the people that got the, the materials, because as volunteers, we're given the materials and we just use, use them. So that would be hopefully done through grants and through donations given to uh, the friends of the cemetery. And that's what keeps us going, is people that are interested see the beauty of what we're doing and okay. keeping it alive by either donating or helping with grants. Yeah, and I know you, uh, I believe at the most recent town meeting received a, a community preservation grant to work on this project as well. So like you said, yeah, grants and, and donations really help keep this project going. 
Yeah, so absolutely. Okay, so we're going to move on to our second presenter. Thank you so much, Ruth. Um, the second presentation is by uh, Judy Trainer, and it chronicles the perils of going to sea and will show us the final resting places of some Yarmouth seafarers. The stones from ancient cemetery in Yarmouth Port, Massachusetts. My name is Judy Trainer, and I am one of the volunteers who are cleaning gravestones in the Yarmouth Port ancient cemetery. I am excited to share with you some remarkable gravestones that tell of Yarmouth seafaring history. These are stories of men who ventured far from Cape Cod and who earned their living from the sea. Many never returned and are remembered by slate or marble stones standing over empty graves. It is also the story of those who were left behind, wives who became widows, parents who lost sons, and children who grew up fatherless. Wander around ancient cemetery and you will find everywhere evidence of Yarmouth's close ties to the sea. The three sons of Chandler and Lucy Gray share one memorial. They died far from home and within a few years of each other. First, Samuel died in New Orleans at age 21. Chandler, the son who died at age 20, was the second officer on a ship sailing from Spain when he was lost overboard. And according to the report, the night being dark, they were unable to save him. Thomas, the third brother, died at sea just a year later at age 19. Imagine the grief of these parents over such loss and with no bodies to bury. The slate headstone for the three brothers stands over an empty grave. This is called a cenotaph. Some gravestones give us more information than simply lost at sea. Desire Crocker died just seven months after her husband, Ensign Josiah Crocker. Her gravestone tells us that Josiah died at sea on October 10th, 1721, and is buried in Port Royal. Records confirm that his body does rest elsewhere. Josiah's grave is in the Garrison Graveyard in Annapolis Royal, Nova Scotia. Seth Hamlin died in 1820 on his passage from the Sandwich Islands, we now call them Hawaii, Seth was only 24 years old. So many of those who died at sea were young, in their 20s or, or even younger. He is remembered on a gravestone for his sister, who was only 19 when she died. Per the stone, we learn that Seth and Deborah were the only children of Seth and Lydia Hamlin and that the parents lost both of them within two years of each other. This stone with its lovely urn and willow is full of details on the death of Gorham Howland Jr. He died at sea on board the ship Robert G. Shaw on his passage from Charleston, South Carolina to Havre, October 28th, 1847, age 17 years, four months and 14 days. Note the wording, at sea on board, rather than lost at sea. Death records confirm that he died of a fever. We know that he is buried at sea from his epitaph. Rest, loved one rest beneath the ocean swell. We hope ere long to meet thee, redeemed with Christ to dwell. 
Howe's Taylor Jr. was buried at sea. In 1880, his ship was caught in a gale lasting five hours and suffered major damage. Captain Taylor had gone aloft to clear away the wrecked mast and sails, fell to the deck, and was so badly injured that he died the same day and had to be buried at sea. His name was added to the gravestone for his first wife, who had died in 1866, about a year after their marriage. When someone died at sea and the family had no body to bury, it was common practice to add the name of the deceased to the gravestone of a spouse, sibling, or parent. Captain Joseph Hawes, Jr. is buried beneath his gravestone. Sacred to the memory of Captain Joseph Hawes, Jr., master of the schooner Jane, 14 days from Richmond to Hyannis Road, where on the 21st day of October, 1807, on the day of his arrival, after six days of sickness, he closed his virtuous and active life in the 21st year of his age. Imagine the heartbreak of the parents and sister of Captain Hawes when they welcomed home the schooner Jane. Instead of a joyful reunion, they were claiming the body of their son. Their sole comfort would have been marking his grave in the local cemetery. No wonder that they erected a gravestone with such a wonderfully detailed inscription. Captain Alexander Gage of the schooner Comet was taken sick on the 9th and died on the 14th of December, 1808 in Tarpaulin Cove on his passage from Savannah to Hyannis where the vessel with its remains arrived on the 16th, being in the 17th year of his age. Tarpaulin Cove is on the Elizabeth Islands, a short distance from the southwest tip of Cape Cod, and is written here, just two days sail to Hyannis. It seems curious that the dates of Alexander's sickness were so carefully recorded on his gravestone, but timing was everything here. Alexander would have been anxious to return home to his young bride. He had married Clara Hallett only 10 months earlier. On November 24th, Clara had given birth to their first child, a daughter named Elizabeth Jane. Alexander would have been in Savannah or at sea at the time of the baby's birth. He never saw his child, and probably did not even know that she had been born. Clara became a widow only three weeks after becoming a mother. Captain John Studley was shipwrecked in 1832. How do we know that? Well, his story is inscribed on his gravestone. His death was occasioned by being shipwrecked on the backside of Cape Cod on board the ship Warren of which he was master. There is so much more to the story behind this stone. The ship Warren was 14 days from Turks Island, which is near the Bahamas and bound for Boston. It was fully loaded with a cargo of salt when it was caught in a severe snowstorm a few miles from Provincetown on November 30th. The sea made a complete breach over the vessel while the main and mizzen masts were cut away by the storm. The captain and crew lashed themselves to rigging and chains. The storm was so violent that no assistance could be gotten from the shore. The men suffered for two days. There were six failed attempts at rescue before boats could reach the ship. They found eight survivors among whom was the captain's 15-year-old son. The steward and two seamen had been washed overboard to their deaths. Captain Studley and the cook were on board, but were found frozen to death. The body of the captain was brought to Provincetown and then to Yarmouth for burial. 
Captain Studley was originally from Yarmouth, but now lived with his family in Providence, Rhode Island. His widow had a marble gravestone made for him in Providence to mark his grave. Perhaps she planned to eventually join him in Yarmouth port. However, she remarried some nine years later and is buried along with their daughter in Providence. Sadly, Captain Studley rests alone in ancient cemetery. The gravestone for Captain Benjamin Homer tells his story. His schooner, the Huntress, was shipwrecked on Sandwich Beach in December of 1825. He was frozen to death on board. Just two years previously, his son Lauren was lost from on board the brig Massachusetts on her passage to Boston from Bremen. Nearby is the stone for two more sons. Asa died in 1830, Benjamin died in 1828 in South America. Perhaps saddest of all is the grave marker for Susan Homer. It stands between the gravestones for her husband and sons. There is no mention of the sea, but the sea profoundly affected her life. She lived as a widow for another 32 years after the tragic death of her husband in 1825. One son had died far from home in 1823. Two more sons died in their 20s and within five years of their father. Susan had given birth every two to three years since her marriage to Benjamin in 1796. Now she was left a widow with young children, including eight-year-old twin daughters. When she died in 1857 at age 79, her surviving children, knowing what loss she had experienced in her life, had inscribed on her marker, Dear Mother, rest from sorrow free. Then there is the story of the gale of 1841. This storm caused so much loss of men and ships that the fishing industry never recovered on Cape Cod. Many villages suffered tremendous personal loss. Yarmouth was no exception. Ebenezer Matthews, age 15, was supposed lost at sea, October 3rd, 1841. Note the use of the word supposed. There was no news. His schooner just never returned home. Heman Matthews, age 21, was lost at sea, here described as the destructive gale of October 3rd, 1841. Most tragic of all is the story of Isaac and Hannah Matthews. They married in 1838. A child was born the following year, but died on the day of its birth. In 1841, Hannah gave birth to a second child, a daughter who also did not survive. Hannah then died on September 1st, three days after the death of her baby. Both mother and child were interred in the same grave. Her grieving husband, Isaac, lived for only another month. He was lost at sea, and all who sailed with him in the destructive gale of October 3rd, 1841. The men who perished on October 3rd, 1841, all knew one another. They fished, they sailed together. They lived within a few miles of each other. Heman Matthews and Isaac Matthews were brothers. Isaac and Ebenezer Matthews were both on the lost schooner Primrose, along with three men from the Bray family, who together left behind three widows and 11 children. The epitaph on the bottom of the gravestone for Hannah and Isaac is appropriate for this young couple 
who suffered so much tragedy. It also speaks for all of the people of Yarmouth who lived from and by the sea. O oh, piteous lot of man's uncertain state, what woes on life's eventful journey wait? By sea, what treacherous calms, what sudden storms, and death attendant in a thousand forms. Okay, thank you so much, Judy, for that presentation. I'm gonna go ahead and unmute Judy so she can answer some questions here. I've already got one in the chat for you, but let me just check real quick to see if anyone has their hands raised. All right, so I'm gonna start you with this one, which I think is a great question. Have you found any gravestones in other Cape Cod cemeteries for men who were lost in the Gale of 1841? And if so, how do they compare to the gravestones in the ancient cemetery? Um, thank you, Marie. Um, the gale of 1841 affected every town on Cape Cod that was involved with the fishing industry. Um, two towns, though, stand out as being um, most impacted by the gale, and that story is in their cemeteries. In Truro, there is an obelisk that was erected in the Congregational Church Cemetery, a marble obelisk, and on it are the names of the 57 men, the 57 fishermen in, of Truro who perished in the gale of 1841. Um, the storm was, was devastating to Truro. I mean, the fishing fleet never recovered. There were countless widows and orphans left as a result of the gale. But also noteworthy is Dennis, um, a short distance away from the ancient cemetery in Yarmouth Port um, is the village cemetery in Dennis. It's right on 6A next to the Unitarian Church. And in that cemetery are a number of gravestones, marble gravestones. Most of them have been cleaned, so they're easily read. And they are for men who also died in the gale of 1841. And most of them tell the story of the schooner bride. This was a locally made schooner uh, caught in the gale. There were nine men on the bride um, when it was caught in the gale. One man was washed overboard, but the others, the eight men, stayed on the gale, they locked themselves in the ship's cabin, so below decks, um, the gay schooner bride was recovered off of Provincetown after the storm was over. And what they found when they went on the schooner was were the bodies of eight of the men. And that story is told on the gravestones that they died in the schooner bride. So it's a little different from the stones that you have seen here in this presentation where people are described as supposedly lost at sea. They knew what happened to these men. They were able to recover the bodies and they were able to bury them, give them a, a burial on land. Hopefully that gave some comfort to the families. All right. Thanks, Judy. Um, I've got a, another uh, kind of a comment here, and this is coming from Bill Mulcahy, who has actually asked a couple of the other questions I've, I've uh, spoken tonight. He's from the Washington Historical Society, just so uh, our ancient cemetery folks are aware. And uh, he typed in to uh, uh, say that his Two-time great uncle Charles Howard Robin was all, was lost at sea and has a cenotaph in the ancient cemetery. The poem on it is very beautiful. Mm. The inscription says, Charlie, thou hast gone and left us, and we miss thee from our side, but we know thou safely landed just beyond the harbor tide. Mm. That is quite lovely. What is the date on that gravestone? 
Daniel, do you have a date for us that you can add? Okay, hang on, Bill. I'm gonna mute you. Unmute you, okay? Hi. Uh, yes. Um, it just has a year, 1880, but uh, okay. through some research, uh, he died on May the uh, 11th, I believe, 1880. Um, he was on board a ship called the General Butler. Uh, he died of consumption. And uh, there was a captain uh, in command. His name was Ryder. Um, this may have been in this uh, Pacific. I haven't uh, got that research finished yet. <laughs> hmm. Fascinating. But I like that just beyond the harbor tide. Oh, I thought it was beautiful. I, I've been mm -hmm. looking at it since I was a little boy. And um, of course, the Robbins family, there's a lot of them there in the ancient cemetery. Mm -hmm. And um, they have a big connection to, uh, to, you know, to the sea. Captain uh, Sil Sylvanus Robbins, uh, my third great grandfather was a was a sea captain. Mm -hmm. His house used to be on the uh, the tour. They used to give the captain's tour along the King's Highway. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Thank you. Still do that uh, the captain's mile tour along uh, Old King's Highway or, or Route right. Six in the Yarmouth part. Uh, you can see the the walking tour. We actually have the brochures online uh, as well as at our cobbler shop too. If you want to do a self guided version. Mm -hmm. All right, we've got one more question about the storm. Um, is the storm thought to have been a hurricane? Um, get, get, the word gale. I mean, um, was more commonly used than hurricane during that time period. Um, it refers to the uh, how fast the winds were. Gale force winds, really one in the same. All right, thanks. And I, I think something about uh, hurricanes and bad weather is going to come up in our fifth presentation tonight. But I'm not going to give any spoilers away, so you'll have to, to stay tuned. Uh, but next up is going to be Kelly Morton who learned new skills, uh, met new friends, and my personal favorite, uh, introduced Mikey the dog to some stories behind the stones that she cared for in the Howland family lot. So next up, we're gonna be hearing from Kelly Morton. Hello, I'm Kelly Morton. I was assigned seven beautiful marble stones to work on during the COVID summer of 2020. All were for the Howland family, whose curb lot enclosure is toward the front of Ancient Cemetery, not far from the Center Street Gate. This was my first year with the RIP project, and I loved it. I learned a lot about the gravestones and about the proper way to clean them. I had my pail of brushes, picks, special cleaning solution, and other tools, along with guidance from Chris Greeley, a wonderful mentor. Chris was always there to encourage and instruct with such friendly patience. I also met other new volunteer friends. Here is Deb Bianchi called Deb 100. 100 for the number of gravestones she has cleaned. Last fall at one of our cemetery gatherings, Deb supplied us all with daffodil bulbs and she actually planted them for the Howland family. And when I was through, it was so rewarding to see the lovely carving that I, that I uncovered under all the dirt and lichen. I'm sure the stones had never been cleaned because at the start, I could barely make out some of the inscriptions. I was lucky enough to have a beautiful cypress tree next to my area, for at certain times of the day, it could be blistering hot. I was also thankful for the nearby water faucet with an attached hose for wetting down the stones during the cleaning process. My little dog, Mikey, was a constant companion and waited patiently as I worked. I began to have a schedule to go to the cemetery at certain times of the day to have a plan that allowed me to finish the work before the cool weather set in. I was so amazed to see the grime and dirt streaming down the part I had just washed, suddenly revealing an inscription. 
first with one stone and eventually with the entire Howland family gathered there in their family lot. The first stone is for the father, Gorham Howland, who was born in 1800, the son of Joshua and Rebecca Taylor Howland. Gorham descended from John and Elizabeth Tilly Howland, who arrived together on the Mayflower. Gorham was a seaman and is listed in several official records as captain. He died in 1873 from gangrene at the age of 72. Gorham's wife was Hannah Knowles Taylor, the daughter of Solomon and Hannah Dyer Taylor. Hannah was born in 1807 and died in 1892 of cancer. She was 87. Gorham and Hannah had six children, Gorham, Alfred, Helen, Solomon, Sarah, Abby, and an unknown infant son who died in 1843 at two months and whose grave is marked with a small broken off headstone carved with a weeping willow tree. Gorham Howland Jr. died at sea aboard the ship Robert B. Shaw on its passage from Charleston, South Carolina to Havre, France. Young Gorham was just 17 years, four months and 14 days old, although one town official record gives his death age as 18. His cause of death is recorded simply as fever. His gravestone bears a beautiful weeping willow and urn and carries this touching epitaph. Rest, love one, rest beneath the ocean's swell. We hope ere long to meet thee, redeemed with Christ to dwell. Daughter Helen lies beneath another beautifully carved marble stone, decorated with roses and closed in a circular frame. Look at the rose broken off and fallen away from the plant. It represents Helen's death while in the bloom of life. Helen died of consumption at age 22 in the summer of her days. In the bloom of life, she is remembered with this gentle epitaph. Helen, we bore thee to thy rest in the summer of thy day. Our tears are still upon our cheeks, but thine are washed away. Her brother Solomon's gravestone might have offered comfort with words of, of a heavenly reunion. Solomon also died of consumption when 18. Consumption, also called the wasting death of tuberculosis, was the primary cause of death in Europe and North America in the 19th century. There were so many young deaths from this disease. The pointing tells you to look about for the carved message, meet me in heaven, and the reassuring words below, I die happy. Solomon's epitaph reassures all that he sleeps in Jesus and is blessed. Gorham and Sarah's youngest daughter, Sarah Abbey, married Joseph N. Babson in 1879. Their marriage is recorded in Rhode Island and also in Montreal, Canada, where the couple made their home. Yarmouth records Sarah records show that Sarah Abbey Howell and Babson died in Montreal, Canada at the age 50 of typhoid rheumatism. She is reunited with her family in the Howland lot and commemorated as a wife over the top arch of her small marble gravestone. Husband Joseph Babson remarried the following year. I've become quite connected to these Howlands after spending the summer with them. These elegant white marble stones so beautifully carved and lovingly inscribed tell of the devotion and history of this Howland family. I hope that the next time you pass by their lot, you too will think of them as neighbors and stop a moment to reflect on their lives. Okay, thanks so much, Kelly. Um, I've already got one question for you. Um, actually, one just popped up that I want to read. So let me go ahead and uh, unmute you so you can respond. 
Um, so we've got a great question, oh, comment actually from Sarah Conrad Firm, who says, my name is Sarah and I'm married to a Joseph. So <laughs> thanks, Sarah. Um, we've also got another question in the chat that says, uh, is there a marker for Captain Asa Eldridge? I haven't claimed one. I haven't claimed one. I just did the Howland family on tw the, in, in the summer of 20. Um, but I could refer perhaps to Judy Trainer. Perhaps she knows where the where he is. Where she's in our in our uh, spreadsheet. We'll check to see if it's in the spreadsheet that we keep of every cl clean stone. Okay, so for James, who sent that question in, if you want to send an email to info at hsoy.org, um, I can go ahead and let you know when we check the spreadsheet and can get that answer for you. Um, another question that's popped up is what is the earliest stone in the cemetery? Laurel, I think you might be able to answer that one. The earliest uh, remaining stone that we have is 1689. Okay. 1698. 98. Sorry, 1698. Little dyslexic. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Laura. For Margaret Miller. I love that you just know that off the top of your head. Mm -hmm. I feel like you just know all the spreadsheets of everyone uh, in Ancient Cemetery. You've worked with them for so long. Um, okay. Also from Sarah, she says, I have heard the cemetery is haunted. Does anyone have any experience with ghosts in the cemetery? One of us. No, no, no. I wish they would have happen a little. <laughs> Nice. Anything from Mikey? Did, did Mikey uh, act strange at all? Uh, maybe no, saw something you didn't? He's in the car. No, he's <laughs> just so happy to be there and he stays in the car in the air conditioning while I'm out scrubbing in the heat. <laughs> oh, okay. I see how it is. Yeah. He just keeps an eye on me. All right. Uh, one more question for you, Kelly. Uh, how did you personally hear about volunteering to clean the stones? So how did you get involved with this group? Well, I have a friend, um, Marianne, who is talking about this group. And um, she mentioned that she knew Laurel. And I said, oh, I would love to, 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 to see about this and see if I could join in. And so she had a chat with Laurel and, and Laurel invited me to a meeting at Sturgis Library. And I was just fascinated. It was just amazing to hear what was going on and what they were doing. And so that's what happened. <laughs> You're lucky to have her. Thank you. <laughs> I'm lucky to have you. Uh, okay. Uh, how, how many volunteers do we have that are part of the project, Laurel? We have 20 that are committed to cleaning um, and we ask every year. So every year they come back. <laughs> we, we can't handle very many more than that because of all the other work behind the scenes that necessary. So we keep it at around 20, 21 all the time. And we have some genealogy, uh, genealogists who have volunteered to help with researching the records. Um, and that's a very, very, very helpful group. Um, so building off of that, um, we have an, another question that just came in. Does the group do any repairs to the stones that may have been broken or vandalized? No, we, <clears throat> we really are not um, trained to do that. And the, the town has not yet wanted us to do that. So we have our hands full with cleaning. We have cleaned 900 stones in the last, 900 stones in the last several years. But we have a thousand records, more than a thousand people, but 900 stones we've cleaned. Um, so we still have a lot, a far way to go before we're finished with the first round of all this cleaning. So we were working with um, a stone conservator and with the town to see that some of these that are broken um, and need other help will be taken care of. And, uh, soon. 
Ancient cemetery is is owned by the the town of Yarmouth, correct? Correct. It's one of the seven town owned cemeteries. And we have a, a message as well. Congratulations on the high count. It, it really is astonishing the number that that you've cleaned, but also uh, researched and recorded as well. Yeah, and it's it's thanks to the volunteers. I mean, they are the ones who have done this. This is totally grassroots project. So. We're pleased. Absolutely. Kudos to, to all of you for the, the work that you've been putting in. Okay. Um, I also want to add in an update from uh, Judy Trainer, who says that Captain Asa Eldridge was lost at sea, so there is no uh, physical burial in the town of Yarmouth. Oh, thank you. Um, and a follow-up is, are there any listings from Ancient Cemetery that you can find on the Find a Grave uh, website? Yes. All right. Thanks so much, Laurel. Okay, we're gonna move into our uh, next presentation, which I believe is actually you, Laurel. Um, and uh, Laurel uh, is gonna be telling us about uh, Lizzie Ryder Taylor. So um, sandwiched between the, the very stark dates of birth and death that we have, Laurel is gonna tell us the many small stories of a Yarmouth Port family that is uh, brought to life in the diaries of Lizzie Ryder Taylor. Stories from the Stones, Elbridge and Lizzie Ryder Taylor. Although this plain granite grave marker includes no carved symbols or added epitaphs to tell us about the lives of the family buried here, the Historical Society of Old Yarmouth is fortunate to have a day-by-day -day chronicle of this Taylor family in the daily writings of Lizzie Ryder Taylor the daughter, wife, and mother who lived between the gravestones book and dates, 1842 to 1918. Lizzie left us a faithful accounting of the comings and goings of her busy family and of the community around her. Lizzie grew up in Kumaquid Village, the second of Wilson and Betsy Marston Riders, 10 children. Agnes, the first Aza, and Clara Ryder had all died before Lizzie began her diary in 1886. They are buried in Woodside Cemetery on Summer Street. If you have visited the Historical Society of Old Yarmouth's Bangs Hallett House Museum, you may have noticed this needlework sampler hanging in the front bedroom. It was stitched in 1832 by 11-year-old Betsy Marston, Lizzie's mother. The young sampler maker grew up and married a successful local farmer and neighbor named Wilson Ryder. Wilson and Betsy owned and farmed an expansive family acreage just to the west of the Yarmouth Barnstable town line. Lizzie Ryder was the second born of their 10 children. Lizzie Ryder married Elbridge Taylor on the 4th of July in 1861. Lizzie was 19. Elbridge, who was 24, went on to become one of Yarmouth's most well-respected house carpenters. He is a rather quiet, hardworking presence in the family narrative. During the years of Lizzie's journal keeping, she makes note of where Elbridge works each day of the, um, and of the many homes and public buildings that he is engaged in constructing or repairing, including the impressive summer home for Dr. Gorham Bacon, now the abandoned Anthony's Kumakwood Inn, the Catholic Chapel on Summer Street, the Captain Isaac Bray home on Main Street, and countless others. Elbridge left no diary, but homeowners renovating or building additions to their older homes sometimes uncover a long ago message or carpentry doodle penciled by Elbridge. Elbridge Taylor done this work for Mrs. Gorham Bacon, January 18, 1901. I was then 63 years of age. Today it has been snowing. Goodbye. When this is found, I suppose I shall be under the ground. 
The Taylor family home across the street from the Yarmouth Port Library was built by Elbridge in the early 1870s. We believe the bearded man standing behind the fence is Elbridge, and the two young ladies are likely his daughters, Alice and Mimi. Taylors lived in the center of the village, only a few doors west of the school where the fire station now stands, and close to the first congregational church, the focus of much of Lizzie's religious and social life. Elbridge and Lizzie had nine children, Alice, Mimi, Betsy, Elbridge, Lucy, Sanny, Benton, a second Elbridge, and Ruth. As their gravestone sadly attests, Elbridge and Lizzie carried five of their children to the grave before the young ones reached adulthood. Lucy Lane, Elbridge, Benton Pulsifer, Betsy, and a second Elbridge are all remembered with dates of birth and death on the family marker. Elbridge Jr., the first of the two sons named Elbridge, nine-month-old Benton Pulsifer and daughter Betsy Taylor all died within days of one another during the terrible diphtheria epidemic of 1879. There were 13 more deaths from diphtheria in Yarmouth that year. The final name on the family gravestone is for the couple's oldest daughter, Alice Taylor, 1862 to 1951. Alice, who never married, was a founding member of the Friday Club and often took charge of one of the shops on Main Street, a space now occupied by the Yarmouth Pediatric Practice. She continued to live at home and shared many of the increasingly burdensome household chores, the weekly washing, ironing, cleaning, gardening, meal preparation, and seasonal canning. Alice remained active in the village community well into her old age, residing in the family home until her death in 1951 at age 89. The house is still lived in by descendants of the great great grandfather who built it. Daughter Elmira called Mimi to distinguish, distinguish her from her aunt Elmira was two years younger than her sister Alice. Mimi often worked at the clothing factory often referred to in the diary as the shop, with a small group of mostly women who sewed overalls and other work clothes in the factory, a large barn-like space behind one of the Main Street houses. Miami, along with each of the other Taylor siblings, were also much in demand as cranberry pickers during the annual harvesting season. Miami, Taylor, and Frank Howes were married in June 1893 in a lovely evening ceremony, which took place under a flower bedecked arch in the parlor of the bride's home. The couple moved to Dennis Village, but kept constant ties with the busy Taylor household in Yarmouthport. Mimi and Frank had no children. Their graves are near other housed family members in the Dennis Village Cemetery. Lizzie and Elbridge's only surviving son, Serenus Williams Hall Taylor, or Sanny as he was called, was 10 years old when Lizzie began her journal. Reading through the daily entries that describe each child's whereabouts and activities, a reader can follow year by year as Sanny grows to manhood, marries Miss Mitty Pitts in 1904, and proudly introduces, introduces their two sons, Edgar and Elbridge, into the family narrative. This is a rare photo of Elbridge with his son, Sanny, and young grandson. It was taken a few years before Elbridge's death in 1912. Sanny and Mitty and Sanny's second wife, Estella Louise Taylor, are buried in ancient cemetery just a few lots away from his parents and siblings. Lizzie and Elbridge's youngest daughter, Ruth, was just six months old when the diary begins. As Lizzie recorded on March 22nd, 1886, Alice, Mimi, Sanny, and Ruth 
went up to have their pictures taken. Ruth is nine months old today. Ruth figures prominently in the daily comings and goings of the family, and we were able to watch her parade through every stage of infancy, childhood, adolescence, and in 1912, her marriage to Gorham Pulsifer, the son of the village's beloved family doctor. Ruth and Gorham Pulsifer lie beneath a central family marker, just a short distance away from their respective parents. The Pulsifer's only daughter, Elizabeth, who died of scarlet fever at the age of 15, shares their family lot. On a hot August 28, 1900, Elbridge and Lizzie's four surviving children gathered in the yard with their parents for this family photograph. In her diary, Lizzie noted, had our pictures taken in a group this noon by Elmer Hallett. Lizzie Ryder Taylor, the widow of Elbridge Taylor, and one of the community's oldest citizens passed peacefully away on the morning of April 4th, 1918 at her home in Yarmouthport. Mrs. Taylor was the daughter of the late Wilson and Betsy Marston Ryder and is survived by four children. Mr. S. W. H. Taylor of Winchester, Miss Alice H. Taylor of Yarmouthport, Mrs. Frank Wallace Howes of Dennis, and Mrs. Gorham Pulsifer of Yarmouth. The funeral was held from her late home Saturday afternoon. Mrs. Taylor was actively identified with the Congregational Church and was an ex-president and longtime treasurer of the local WCTU. The Women's Christian Temperance Union. So there are many family stories lying dormant between the sentinel dates of birth and death. Help us discover more stories from the stones. Thank you. All right, thanks so much, Laurel. I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you in preparation for some of our questions. Um, I know I have a, a question for you. So where is Lizzie's diary now? And can you tell us some more information about it? Um. Lizzie's many diaries, there are many of them, are in the Historical Society of Old Yarmouth in the vault. There is also a transcript, and there is also online at the computer at the Historical Society. As it's very lengthy, she wrote for 27 years. She wrote every day. She never wrote anything terribly personal but you did get to know the people and the community because there were several thousand names in this diary of people that she met or things that were happening or uh, presenters that came to talk at the church or just friends. Uh, so uh, what years does it cover? I know you said she had quite the, the time span. Okay, it it's... Uh, it's a chronicle of this village between 1886 and 1913. Okay, uh, and you mentioned there, there's around a, a thousand different names mentioned. How can people check to see if maybe one of their ancestors or, or someone is mentioned in the diary? Well, they can, they can go to the cobbler shop, to the Historical Society of Old Yarmouth, and check out the... Um, the, the digital copy that's on the computer. Um, there is a spreadsheet index of the first time every name is mentioned. So it's not an every name every day because many of the people were mentioned every day, but there is a, a, a spreadsheet index and it does not cover the 4,500 <laughs> footnotes where a lot of the information is in the footnotes, but it would direct you to it. All right, thanks, Laurel. A uh, couple more questions for you. Um, 
So two kind of related questions. How did you find the photos and are the photos you showed in the collection of the Historical Society? Uh, many of the photos, I would say most of the family photos were from the family that still own the house and who became very good friends when Dot Henyon and I, she and I worked on this together for about eight years. Um, and so they shared a lot of the family photos that we had. I think some are in the collection of HSOY, um, maybe none that we used right here, but there are some of, uh, some of the family. And for those of you who would like to look at some of the photos from our collection, uh, you can view all of the uh, photos from the Historical Society online at Digital Commonwealth. And we have uh, around 5,000 photos that have been digitized and uploaded to that uh, online resource. So you can do that from your own home. You don't have to make an appointment to come in to do some research. You can actually uh, check those out online at Digital Commonwealth and uh, look at our collection of photos. Uh, a few more questions for you, Laurel. You're not off the hook yet. Um, actually, another comment from uh, Bill Mulcahy from the Washington Historical Society saying that Eldridge Taylor is his fifth cousin, five times removed through his fifth great grandfather, Richard The Rock Taylor, uh, 1620 to 1703. Right, oh, like that nickname there. Um, related to that, though, with the Taylors, is Elbridge uh, Taylor related to the Taylor Bray farm? The the Taylors from Taylor Bray. Yes, he is. He's. It's many generations back, as Bill just mentioned. Um, Richard the Rock Taylor of the Taylor Bray farm was a very distant relative of Elbridge. He's many generations forward from that. Okay, and a question from Maria Ferrari for you. So heads up, Laurel. Uh, can you tell the story about how you found the wood with pencil messages? Uh, it's a long story. It's sort of a shaggy dog story, but um, I went looking and I, I was looking for something else and I stopped in the driveway on a rainy day of this house and uh, told him what I was looking for. And um, they brought me inside and happened to show happened to show me the two boards that they found when they were uh, renovating their house. Uh, they were just up in the attic area. Um, happened to turn them over, and that was Elbridge's message. And he he and other other um, builders apparently did that quite often. So if you have an old old uh, beam in your house or something, you ought to turn it over see what's there. It was, it was purely an accident. A, a very good uh, serendipitous. Yeah, it was ex wonderful. Yes. All right. So Laurel, I think you, you are good. We're going to move on to our final speaker this evening, which is going to be Melanie Barron. Uh, and she is recounting a very colorful legend of a ship, a pirate, and the myth of Maria Hallett. So you, you might recognize some of the names that are mentioned here in this next presentation. Yeah, I just want to get wait, wait till she does. Right. Bear with me one second here. A ship, a pirate, and the myth of Maria Hallett. The ship is the Witta Galley, built in England in 1716 as a slave ship to be used in the lucrative triangle trade to carry goods from England to West Africa in exchange for slaves. The English then sold slaves to Caribbean plantations in exchange for goods, including gold and silver to bring back to England. A pirate is Captain Sam Bellamy, born near Plymouth, England in 1689. Young Sam got his sea legs aboard ships of the British Royal Navy, visited the Cape in 1715 before finding adventure as a daredevil pirate captain of his own fleet of thieving ships. 
Captain Bellamy was tall, dark, and boldly handsome, as is true in romantic myths. The myth is about Mary or Maria Hallett, reported to be a beautiful young independent girl with golden locks, eyes as blue as hyacinths, as the love interest in this folktale. She is said to have been born in Yarmouth to wealthy landowners. Many versions of this legend make it hard to follow one storyline, but all accounts have a common thread. Dashing Sam Bellamy sees beautiful Mary or Maria Hallett as she sits under a flowering apple tree in East Ham and falls instantly and hopelessly in love. The wealthy Hallets, of course, forbid the young lover's relationship. Sam goes off again to sea, vowing to return to claim Mary Maria as his bride as soon as he becomes rich enough to be worthy of her love. You can see what's ahead, I trust. While Sam is relentlessly pursuing wealth and becoming the richest pirate in the golden age of piracy, Maria finds herself pregnant with their child, unacceptable in these times. Heartless friends and family turn Maria away and the pearl girl takes shelter in a barn where she gives birth to a baby boy. When she leaves the barn in search of food, the infant dies, choked on a straw, they say. Her woe is compounded when she is charged with murdering her own child. Mercilessly punished and thrown into jail, her prospects of happily ever after seem hopelessly diminished. But she escapes from jail three times, which can only be because she's a witch, a beautiful, shameful, murderously wicked witch, sometimes called Goody Howell. However, she prevails and goes to live in a hut among the dunes on the south side of Wellfleet, where she can gaze far beyond the restless waves, waiting for distant sails to herald Sam's faithful return. Meanwhile, Captain Black Sam Bellamy was determined to find a tall masted ship that was swift and beautiful to crown his pirate fleet to impress Maria when he returned. In the windward passage between Haiti and Cuba, he came upon the widow galley laden with treasure on a journey home to England in February 1717. Sam overtook command of the widow. The slave ship was now a pirate ship. Bellamy swore he would see Maria Hallett if he had to sail his vessel over the dunes of the Cape to her door. Bellamy sailed the widow toward the outer shores of Wellfleet when on April 26, 1717, the Cape experienced a violent Arctic gale that mercilessly destroyed the Witta in a frozen tangle of wreckage. The Witta sank a few miles from shore right below Maria's hut. Captain Bellamy's body was never found. But some say that Bellamy found his way to Maria's hut where she nursed him to health until they moved to Provincetown. Others say they reached Maine, where the rest of his pirate fleet and treasure awaited. This from the narrow land by Elizabeth Reynard. We know the Witta Galley, discovered in 1984, and Sam Bellamy are both real. But who was Maria Hallett? In one version, of our folklore, it's possible that Mary or Maria may have returned to Yarmouth to live out her days with a reunited family. The case for this Maria Hallett being Mary Hallett actually was strongly suggested by Catherine, Kathleen Brunel in her 2010 book, Bellamy's Bride, The Search for Maria Hallett of Cape Cod. There are those who believe that the Mary Hallett buried in ancient cemetery in Yarmouth was the beautiful young girl to whom Captain Bellamy gave his heart. This Maria Hallett is the daughter of John and Mary Howes Hallett, 
born around 1698, making her 17 when she met Sam in 1715. Mary Hallett's gravestone is made of gray green slate, a type often used by Plymouth County gravestone carvers. Although badly worn and broken, it can still be read in memory of Mrs. Mary Hallett, who died April 22nd, 1750, in the 57th year of her age. There are several things to note about this otherwise ordinary stone. If you look very carefully, you will see Mrs. lightly scribed preceding Mary Hallett's name. What's that doing there? I'll come back to it in a minute. Mary died in the 57th year of her age. The letter Y in Yi represents a letter we no longer have in our alphabet, which takes on the sound as in the or that. Yi should be pronounced the. Mary died in her 57th year, which means that she was still 56 years of age. Her 56th birthday was behind her, but she had not yet reached her 57th birthday. Also notice how the carver employs subtle guidelines to help him letter in a straight line. Again, if you look closely at the end of the inscription, you may notice two rows of obliterated lettering, either intentionally chiseled out or perhaps remnants of some previous lettering on a reused stone the words remain undecipherable. You may see evidence of letters E, F, I, and M. What message was purposely removed? The missing lines only add to several other mysteries about Mary Hallett. This is the gravestone of Mary's brother, Andrew Hallett, in memory of Mr. Andrew Hallett, who deceased April ye 26, 1751, in ye 68th year of his age. Mary's gravestone itself is a duplicate of the stone for her brother, Andrew Hallett, who died just four days after Mary's death in 1751. You notice Mary's gravestone said she died in 1750. Both stones were made in Plymouth County, Mass. by Carver William Cushing. More clearly defined on Andrew's intact stone compared to Mary's is the skull-like soul effigy with round eyes, stylized nose, and the mouth mark design that often takes the place of teeth on many Plymouth County stones. Note the archaic rendering of the numeral five, seldom seen on stones this late in the 18th century. While we're looking at Andrew Hallett's stone, note the impact of weathering on a slate stone. Here, original Yarmouth vital records give Mary's death year as 1751. The record also indicates she was a single woman, not the missus she becomes on her gravestone. So is this Captain Bellamy's Mary Maria Hallett? The stone suggests by the use of Mrs. that Mary was married to a Mr. Hallett, but official records are ambivalent and her own will and Yarmouth vital records describe Mary as a spinster. And if she was Mrs. Hallett, where is Mr. Hallett? Not in any records and apparently not buried near this Mary. Mary's own will pictured here definitely does not refer to a husband or any children, which strongly suggests that the Mrs. title used on her gravestone was a carver's careless assumption that Mary was married. Mary notes that her gold beads should not be included with two gold rings given to her sister, Hope Griffith. Mary Hallett of Yarmouth left a lover's golden rings to her only surviving sister, Hope Griffith, who died in 1784. The gravestone for Hope Griffith has fallen to the ground with remnants 
of a cement base. Where would she have acquired gold beads? Why keep the necklace when she was prepared to die? Was she buried with the necklace? There is little remarkable in this inventory list of her items. Did Mary die in 1750 as the chiseled date attests? Or did she die in 1751 as is in the written original entry record? Mary Hallett, single woman, died on April 22nd, 1751. And the very next line in the record book is the entry documenting Andrew Hallett's death four days later. Andrew Hallett died on April 26, 1751. Is Mary Hallett actually Maria Hallett? After all, this is a Cape Cod legend. The truth about Sam and Maria's relationship will always be shrouded in speculation, said Barry Clifford, who discovered the world's largest pirate collection from the Witta shipwreck off the coast of Wellfleet in 1984, almost 300 years after the crash. There are many versions of this story. This early 18th century romantic legend has captured the imagination of generations on Cape Cod and will continue to be told. You decide. Open it up to some questions now. Thanks so much, Melanie, for that fascinating look at uh, Sam Bellamy and Maria or Mary Hallett. Um, I personally have a couple of questions for you, which I'm I'm sure you're excited to to hear. Um, all right, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you guys. Um, so what I found personally interesting while uh, listening to that was um, Andrew Hallett, Maria's brother, was said to have uh, died on April 22nd. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but April 26th was uh, the date that the widow sank. So the fact that her brother had died on the same date, um, of course, several years after the fact, the widow sank in 1717. Um, just a bit of an interesting, perhaps eerie coincidence there. Awesome. I, don't, I don't know if you knew that, Melanie. <laughs> No, I know you know a lot about the ship. I mean, that, that, that's great to hear. Um, so I had also, I had heard of um, her sister getting the, uh, the rings and that information about the, the gold beads. Um, but we've also heard um, mostly through word of mouth, not really any concrete evidence, but definitely there, there's this legend of someone uh, kind of a, a grizzled sailor looking type potentially oh, right. visiting her grave. Um, did you find any, any information about that? Anything maybe concrete about uh, perhaps a, a mysterious survivor of the shipwreck? <laughs> did we find roses? Did we find um, roses? Uh, roses? Did we find a rose? No. Okay. We found a rose in her grave? No. Oh, really? No. Mm -hmm. we, um, <laughs> no, this is the other story about the man who came visiting um, twice or three times um, where supposedly he first met her in East Cam and then all of a sudden laid down under that apple tree and died and then they found a gold um, belt around him so people think that he came back mourning her and and then lay down and died. That's that's another possibility. Um, but no, I haven't heard much of the, about the grave itself. Um, okay, here's something from the the chat for you. 
So as a Lower Cape resident for decades, I can attest to the fact that Goody Hallett is claimed locally, um, an East Ham resident writing this, and her legend even more romantic. Supposedly, she spent the rest of her days wandering the shore, looking out to sea, waiting for her lover to return. And it continues to this day. Some people have seen, she is still seen among the dunes and on the shoreline searching right. for him. That's a possibility. <laughs> We've heard that um, the term goody as well was, was used at that time to describe an, an unmarried woman. So there's lots of uh, legends of Goody Hallett, who we assist yes. Maria or Mary Hallett. Um, I've also heard the, the Witch of Wellfleet used to describe right. her, potentially right. cursing other sailors um, because her Sam didn't return to her. So she stood out on the cliffs uh, cursing uh, these other sailors who might be trying to return to their loved ones. Yeah, and then there's an, the, another version where she comes across dead having her throat slit by another pirate who thinks that she found the treasure and was keeping it from the pirates who, who survived. And they came back and slit her throat. So there goes that version. <laughs> That's a new one for me. I haven't. Oh, that. no. I, it's quite I, a bit morbid. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so you had mentioned that there were uh, rumors of her being pregnant with with Sam's child. Um, I've I've heard some conflicting accounts that 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 was just a rumor or she actually was. Um, but do you have any information about what happened to the child? What the reason she ended up in jail? was because the good people um, of East Ham accused her of murder because the baby died in the barn. And that's mm -hmm. how she ended up in jail that she broke out of three times, which is then how she got the opinion that she was a witch because how else did she get out of jail three times? Or she um, talked the jailer into letting her out because she was blonde and blue-eyed and beautiful. <laughs> so she could just walk out of the jail. Yes, a, a bit sympathetic there, that, that single mother wanting to return to her child, who, um, who I've heard, you know, she, she left the child in the barn. Um, oh, okay. During the day, which is how the child ended up dying. Um, right. I think it's been repeated that it, it choked to death on a, a piece of hay or straw. Straw, right, <laughs> yeah. right. Yep. Quite, quite sad there. Um, so as far as we know, no, no living descendants from the uh, pirate Bellamy and, uh, and Maria Hallett. Right, that's right. All right. Okay, we've got, uh, got a few comments here. Let me just scroll back to this one um, from Bill Mulcahy again. Uh, John Hallett and Mary Howes Hallett are his eighth great great grandparent, <laughs> and Andrew Hallett is his seventh great great grandfather. And so I also have to point out this other message from the chat that says, "Mr. Mulcahy, why are you in D.C. when you clearly are a Cape Cotter?" <laughs> Good question. All right, I can I can unmute you if you want to if you want to add anything, Bill. Um, yeah, just a quick comment. It's actually, that's a, uh, I was the president of the Washington, New Hampshire Historical Society. Um, so not DC, although I did live there too for a while. Um, oh, but uh, yeah, I did live on the Cape for, for some years. Um, and my family is descended from there. And I've got just dozens and dozens and dozens of uh, ancestors in the ancient cemetery. It's, um, it's amazing. But uh, it's one of my favorite places. I've been going there since I was a, a young child with my great uh, grandmother. And um, that was over 60 years ago. <laughs> All right, well, I really appreciate you uh, sending those comments and, and providing those, uh, those extra details about some Cape Cod genealogy for us this evening. So my thank pleasure. you so much. Um, all right, so ladies um, from the Friends of the Ancient Cemetery, do you have anything else you want to add before we close out this evening? I would just like to acknowledge and thank Maria Ferrari, who did the production and editing and music and 
putting together each of these videos because without her, there would have been no five stories <laughs> behind the stones. So thank you to Maria. Yes, absolutely. And she also did the, the website you folks have as well, friendsofancientcemetery.org. Um, so it looks like that's it from our, our questions. I just want to thank everyone so much for joining us this evening. A very special thank you to our speakers and of course the many volunteers of the Friends of the Ancient Cemetery for the work that they have done cleaning, photographing and recording uh, the stories uh, here. Their work has given a voice to the stones and reminded us of the lives of those who have lived here in the centuries before us. Um, as well, I, I too personally want to thank Maria Ferrari for her efforts producing and recording these videos uh, on behalf of the Yarmouth, uh, the Historical Society of Old Yarmouth. Um, so just a reminder that you can learn more about this project at their brand new website, friendsofancientcemetery.org. Um, especially to check out their online shop. You can find some mugs and prints related to the ancient cemetery. So some of these great photos you've seen featured tonight, uh, you can purchase some prints of those. And of course, all the proceeds go to support their efforts uh, here at the, uh, at the ancient cemetery. So the recording of this program will be uploaded to our website, that's hsoy.org, and it will also be made available on the Friends of Ancient Cemetery website. And I will try to get that uploaded by the end of the week um, so we can all uh, check that out if we wanna rewatch everything and uh, share with some others who couldn't be with us this evening. So thank you so much for joining us. If you are interested in some of our uh, upcoming events at the Historical Society of Old Yarmouth, uh, check out our website and our events page. We do have some, some great walks and the uh, annual ecumenical Thanksgiving service coming up and the uh, sports roll. So thank you so much for joining us. Ladies, thank you for this wonderful presentation. And I hope you all have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you for being there. Thank <laughs> you.